Ah, oh, it's turning on now. Right. Right, is that working? No? No. No wonder it's hidden mute. Again, um, what I want to do today is start asking the question and giving some sort of answers. what this stuff can do to help us understand the language correspondence. Uh, well, what have we got to actually help us? I mean, the language correspondence is determined or specified uniquely by the local constant of a pair of representations, and for our purposes you only need to worry about customs at this point. Um, this is in the sense, of course, of Jacquet, Piotrowski, Shapiro, Shalika, and this is more transparent, but really equally unhelpful. Not Shalika, Shahidi. Um, that's the thing which, at least in the standard setup, governs everything. And can we do anything with it? The answer is no. Not really got the faintest idea how to manage that thing at all. Considering how much information it has to carry, this is not surprising. But the Swan exponent, or the arcing conducted, depending on how you're feeling, that we can handle. <coughs> I have an explicit formula for that, which I'll show you later. Um, uh, well, we have an explicit formula for it on the GL side. It's a little bit tricky to handle on the GL side. The other thing under this special case, we could look at the Godemarge K local constant, which is meant to go with the Langlands to the local constant. And the answer there is yes, we know all about that. There's an explicit formula for it, but we don't use it often enough to worry about it. Right, so that's the situation with regard to uh, one um, family of invariants. The other thing one uses a lot in more classical treatments of the Langmans correspondence, particularly before you knew anything about its existence, are the concepts of base change and its sort of adjoint automorphic induction. Alright, in the original setup, this is mean in the sense of Arthur and Clausel, automorphic induction has a much longer history rambling through Langlands, Shell Stack. I never remember how to spell her name. Um, Shellstat, Kopwitz. Kajan had a go at it. And it was finally nailed down in the form we want by Enya and Becky Herb. The name, number of names indicate just how classic an operation it is. Um, but this base change. For a cyclic extension, base change is an operation on representations of GLNs, which corresponds to the restriction of representation of the play group, and automorphic induction in the same situation corresponds to induction. Right, well here, the answer is, do we have anything like this? And it's sort of. We have a partial thing which works provided K on N is time. It doesn't have to be cyclic, it doesn't even have to be Galois. So there's a 
trade-off between these things. Um, it's, the history is slightly curious. All of this is a characteristic zero theory, as it was, and was around before we knew the language correspondence existed, um, which is why it became very popular at one stage. In positive characteristic, we've known the Langlands correspondence for a very long time because of Lamour, Rappaport and Stuhler, but we didn't have this. So the whole lot had to be done again in um, positive characteristic. Characteristic P, this was done by Enyar and Lamaire. Great sacrifice on their part, a huge paper, um, just to check that the character identities which define these things apply equally well in positive characteristic. So, I want to work in, see how we can use this lot to get some information about the Langlands correspondence. Um, there's also, of course, trivial stuff we all remember, like the Langlands correspondence takes the determinant of the central character, or the other way around, um, which is obvious but pestilential, and it preserves contragredients or representations. So we'll use all that sort of stuff. Right, but before I start that, there's an administrative structure that I have to impose. Um, now, if we take two simple strata attached to the same element, um, in various, they know you need not be in the same matrix ring. There's a canonical or beta canonical, it does depend on the choice of bank beta, bijection. <coughs> I showed it to you yesterday when these two orders live in the same matrix algebra. Um, the definition for Different matrix algebra is a bit round about tiresome and tedious and takes quite a lot of time, um, so I don't think it's a sensible thing to give you. You can transfer these things. Right now, this encourages me to look at class of all simple characters. in all GLNF. Simple characters attached to any old hereditary order in any old matrix ring. Huge class, and I want to impose an equivalence relation to make it manageable. Ordering 
And again, orbitals of V. And an F, FM bending. FI of the field. F of beta I. In this endomorphism ring. Such that. Um, can I say, it's getting tight on the EI, F of beta I, such that FI of, no, that's wrong anyway, A is FI of EI, pure, I equals 1 and 2. That's a trivial business. There's lots of them. Um, okay. So then I can do this transfer business. <coughs> so I can form, let's say, Fi star phi of i. That's a simple character attached to the hereditary order a and the element Fi for phi of i. Right. Now the theorem is, which makes all this work. If F1 of theta 1, F2 of theta 2 <laughs> intertwine. Some datum V A F one F two then same holds for all choices of V A F one F two. So if you can shift the things to the same place and they intertwine once, then they intertwine whenever you shift them to any old same place. Right. Um, remember that intertwining of simple characters on the same order is the same as conjugacy. So that says, we can say, if this holds, So, theta 1 is endo equivalent to theta 2. Another number of our inspired bits in the nomenclature. And indeed, because of the intertwining implies conjugacy, condition, endo equivalence is an equivalence relation. Right, so that gives me something large, but at least I've got a set. So, yeah. It's F, F1 star and F2 star. Um, uh, uh, uh. Oh, yes, sorry. Yes. Right. Uh, and for question that this endo class equivalence is over all, a pair of data, like a, a pair, one in vector space, uh, another is. It's got, in the end, the whole point is it's got nothing to do with the vector space. So, two simple, simple characters. Put them somewhere. If they're the same there, intertwined, then they uh, then their transfer of the original ones to any other vector space is the same. But this is a simple character for what group? Simple character that comes out of here. Hang on, we were. I'll wrap you down now. I started off with 
theta i in there. And AI is sitting inside some vector space, and all of some vector space, so they're quite randomly chosen. They don't start in the same place. Okay. Uh, that's what I'm getting around, is this problem. They have avatars, as the Piatic L function <coughs> people would say, in all sorts of vector spaces. Right. Um, now, I want. EOF is what we call a set of, well, endo equivalence classes too long, so we call them endo classes of simple characters. Um, plus a trivial element. Zero. Zero is the class. Of trivial characters of groups. You take the one, the one unit of any old hereditary order, and I think it was trivial character as a simple character, and you stick all of those together into one in that class, which is the trivial one. I mean, it's got to be there because I've got to account for representations of level zero. Okay. Now, um, if I take um, just a fixed idea as a simple stratum, uh, and a simple character attached to that, and say theta endo class, um, I've got the following invariants. Well, first of all, by which I mean any simple character which lives in here has the same invariants. The degree of the thing is to be the degree of the field extension. Um, the ramification residue class degrees. Um, now we have to be a bit careful with normalizations. A thing like S theta, which is M over E of A. Right, if anything else in that end of the class gives you the same value of that. Um, and K0 of theta, which is K0 of beta A over E of A. These things which vary with dimension, you always normalize by whacking out the uh, period of the order. Those things are invariants of the end of the class. And um, for the trivial one, well, that's one, that's one, that's one, that's zero, and that, who knows what that is, it doesn't matter. It's all with minus infinity, it never turns up. Right. So, there's one thing you can do with this, which turns up later and is a easy but very useful.
in V, or on V, strictly speaking, in the, in the endomorphisms of, of V, and theta, little theta i attached to these, but I've fixed the same order now, because that's the only thing I've fixed. of the given endo classes. I can look at find t greater or equal zero as the least integer k such that Theta 1 restricted to the least integer k is 1 plus k. Um, beta i, a i, in a 1, whoops, 1, 1, intertwines with theta 2. I don't want to be thetas, it doesn't work on a blackboard. Um, there's a stronger version of intertwining implies conjugacy in the, that's not an A1, that's an A, that's the whole point. Um, there's a stronger version of intertwining implies conjugacy when you get truncated simple characters attached to the same order, intertwining implies conjugacy. All right. I then put that A is meant to, choice of A is meant to imply automorphic distance. A theta 1, theta 2 is T over. Right, that's as close as we can get them, in other words. Not worth calling a theorem proposition. A is an ultra metric on. Um, in that it satisfies what well, is symmetric, but <coughs> it separates points at zero if and only if theta one equals theta two. That's the definition of endo equivalence, in fact, and a of theta one theta. Three is less equal to the maximum. A of theta one, theta two, theta two, theta three. Right, and it's symmetric, of course. So it's a jolly nice sort of metric, which comes in very handy as a later stage. Now, let me, well that's that, oh perhaps it would be helpful if I said that if, if zero is the trivial endo class, the distance between zero and anything else is the number I call S. That's not a zeta, it's an S. Right. that little comment. <laughs> so now, 
let me, as the first application of this uh, machinery, give you the conductor formula. Okay. 
something out. So what I do is I take these endo classes, all the original simple characters, and I take there is, there is a hereditary order A in. I want EF by EF matrices um, carrying simple strata. A, M, I, bar, zero, bigger I. I want to shift my bigger I to this bigger vector space. So there's an embedding there which I can't be bothered to give a name to. Right, uh, and hence, realizations, define that word. A realization of an endo class is a simple character which lies in the endo class. It makes it much easier to say that. Lot. Um, so let's say phi i is c of a bigger i of phi i. So that's a transfer of, figure, of the original phi i. Right. So um, I let. T over E be the distance between these two things. So that says, i.e., the phi i <coughs> intertwine on restricting to their development group and their characters can get intertwined, and that T is the smallest possible. Now, now I need to choose a simple stratum. I can do this. I M1 T gamma equivalent to I M1. Hang on, there's a bar or something. R T beta 1. It doesn't matter whether I use beta 1 or beta 2. They're sufficiently close that it makes no difference. Then, I've got everything I need. Gamma, B, B, F, Gamma, C, 
zero. Well, this is the adjoint map, I gamma. Remember that's not gamma sent x. Gamma x minus x gamma. And this one, well, that's the obvious embedding. This one, an s gamma. Gamma. That's a time co-restriction. Right now, that was set up at the beginning. That's the whole point of the adjoint time co-restriction game. Now I choose. Lattices in these spaces. So that, all right, you can guess which lattice goes where L1 to L2 to L3 to L4 to 0, S gamma, A gamma. So that's exact. I'm sure there's a classical name for this particular object. But I don't know it, so I'll just write it down. Then what you do is you choose harm measures on the indicated space in your gamma mu v and you look at Gamma measure of the first lattice times yeah, the B measure of the third lattice over the B measure of the second lattice, gamma measure of the last one. Right, it doesn't obviously it doesn't depend on choice of R measures, and that is Q to the strange C of gamma. And Q, you'll remember. Q is the cardinality of the residue of F. Right, that's where that comes from. Uh, that may not look very helpful, but you can calculate this thing. Any choice of such kind of lattice works? Yeah, yeah so say, yes, however you choose the lattices, you get the same answer. And, um, for some reason I forget. The hard part is finding them. <coughs> right now, well, this thing, C gamma is zero, we can only use gammas in F. Pretty boring case. Um, if we take a minimal element, Right. Um, so, 
this. So, in general. Um, you take a simple, you have to deal with this case. You get a simple stratum. I am zero beta in M D of F, where D is the degree of the field extension, so I have to take the smallest possible version of this field that I'm interested in, the smallest possible order that copes with this field. Um, I set R is minus K0 beta A. I've dealt with the case which is minimal, so no, I can pretend this is not so. Then I can choose, sorry, I have to change notation, a simple, no, I won't change notation, that's an alpha, M, I, alpha, equivalent to A, M, I, beta. And then what I get, I'll keep track of my changes in notation. We abbreviate a bit and then explain. C of beta, which is what we're after, divided by D of beta squared. D of beta is what I call D over there plus R over E of beta, D of beta. So E is the ramification index. There. That is equal to C of gamma on the degree of gamma. It's not gamma, it's alpha. Change notation. C of alpha over D of alpha squared plus R over E of beta, D of alpha. So it looks all pretty much the same, except that beta changes to an alpha, and that beta changes to an alpha, but that one doesn't. All right, so there's the recurrence relation for doing it. Uh, this is his way of working the thing out. Um, let me just comment. Yeah, there's an, an inter, a useful special case. Keep that on board for a moment. Special case. If pi contains simple character theta C of I beta, the Swan exponent of pi shesh cross pi is n squared c beta <coughs> pi is meant to be a possible representation of GLN here. Right, so if the theta is attached to a minimal element, I've got a nice formula like this. In general, I've got a rather complicated one. But of course, if we take the Galois parameter, attached to pi, this thing, swan pi shesh cross pi, is swan sigma shesh tensor sigma. And this thing is surprisingly difficult to work out on the Galois side, even when you're attached to a minimal element. And what you do, how you account, I mean, this is the sort of thing that drives you on here, how you account for all this structure that's turning up in this formula on the Galois side when you don't know anything about the GL parameter, I've got the faintest idea. Well, you've got quite a complicated thing which has got to uh, somehow shake out. 
That's one case where, in fact, in practice, the GL side plus the Langlands correspondence really does help with the Galois representations. Okay, now, what was I going to do? Next. Uh, Yo, oh yes, that's what I wanted to say. Um, it's actually going looking two steps forward, going back to the next Tuesday. Um, let's take an endo pass, just fix an endo pass. This is a reinterpretation of conductor. Um, a unique continuous function. Uh, one more point. Big P of X defined for X greater or equal zero with following properties. So that's the grammar slip. Um, if pi is a customer representation of a GLN containing a simple character of endo. Ah, oh, <coughs> this is going to be out of hand. I've got a moment. Can I go back and say something before I start this? The cuspidal, irreducible cuspidal representation of um, GLN, it contains a simple character, theta pi, unique up to conjugacy. Conjugation. I'll put Big theta of pi is the endo class. Theta pi. Right. So the gloss is take an endo class that exists a unique continuous function. X, X greater equal to zero with the following properties. <coughs> right. Choose N and pi in customable representation of that GLN. All I need is to have a cuspidal with endo class for simple characters, the one I started with. If rho is a cuspidal representation of GLMF, then one exponent of pi shesh cross rho over mn is equal to phi theta of the distance between my original theta and the endo class of simple characters in this representation rho. That looks like ju definition juggling. The sting is in the continuous. It's obviously a piecewise linear function with a finite number of points where you don't quite know how to define it. Um, and that recurrence relation for the German C's tells you that it's continuous. Um, quite a nice little function. Um, obviously, P theta of zero <coughs> is swan, pi chef, or over N 
and squared. Um, after that, oh, I should have said I knew there was something else I had to say. It's piecewise linear. With finitely many jumps. Um, and those jumps come like this. It starts off somewhere here. The first jump occurs at minus k0 theta. The next one is jump <coughs> normal, well, beyond the critical exponent, you approximate your simple stratum by a, a simpler one, and that's the second critical exponent. Then it goes on up and eventually goes far as S of theta and beyond there is X beyond there. Hang on, no, it's not X. Its derivative is 1. It's wherever it happens to wind up. Um, so all the jumps are in this region up to the, I call it the slope of the endoclast, and they come from the jumps given by the structure of the strata. Um, and the key point is that it's convex, of course, obvious from the way I've drawn it. Say it. Okay. Um, so that's again something which will come in handy, and it was quite surprising to find that the uh, recurrence relation was exactly what you needed of the wretched thing was continuous. Um, there's a very close analog on Galois' side, which gives you a continuous convex piecewise linear function, um, giving you the, the formula for the conductor. But it's not the same. It's much more complicated. The relation between the two is quite interesting. But again, I'm giving you a commercial for Tuesday's talk. Um, Right, so there's the conductor formula. It's a, a surprisingly powerful tool. Let me waffle for another minute. You don't use it very often, but experience of... You work on the Galois side often in this game now because it's much easier and you don't have so much to explain. And everything goes along swimmingly until you hit a brick wall. And at that point, the conductor formula sometimes rescues you. It is actually a very deep result. It's not just the classification of cuspidals. Um, you need Shahidi's theory of intertwining, of intertwining operators between parabolically induced representations. He gets the local constant by doing a strange sort of Fourier transform and working out the relation between intertwining operators and the Whitaker model. Um, to actually, when you plug that in, you have to do it twice to get rid of the local constant and leave yourself with the conductor. You end up with a volume calculation um, with very tricky measures involved, and you need the entire theory of semi-simple types. Have you done the theory of semi-simple types, Alan? Not exactly. Okay, you need the theory of semi-simple types which uh, explicitly pick out all the points in the Bernstein spectrum of the GLA. Practically everything I've ever heard of goes in there. Um, so it's gratifying when it does at least do something for you. Okay, thank you. Are there any questions? Yeah. Uh, is there, uh, does the endo equivalence uh, reflect anything on the galaxy? Can you speak to me, not through the machine? <laughs> yeah. Uh, can you see in 
low equivalence on the Galva side? Can, can I see and low equivalence? Yeah. See, I'll tell you tomorrow. <laughs> <laughs> Any other questions? Unless thanks.